Eric Pettigura, who is a professor of physics and astronomy at UCLA, he gave us that, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of of the opposite perspective. Like, I'm really excited about the gaps in our understanding. And, you know, it really occurred to me in this conversation that, especially when we start talking about the possibility of planets migrating between solar systems, which is super far out, um, I was kind of shocked that he wasn't just like, that's ridiculous. Um, he was actually like, well, maybe, but we don't, it seems rare, we don't see it happening. And, you know, you'd need a lot of Goldilocks criteria for that to even occur. But again, the scientific stories that we tell ourselves are necessarily conservative. They're necessarily bounded by what we can say based on the evidence we do have, not on the evidence that very likely may be out there, but we don't have it yet. So I don't know. Astronomy, astrophysics is a really fun topic because it's not pegged to anything dire on Earth necessarily in the immediate sense, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like the scientists that are working in those fields are much more open to paradigm shift and to, you know, reappraising fundamental ideas. Anyways, you're going to love it. Good conversation. If you like what we do, support us on Patreon. We are at patreon.com slash demystify sci. Viewers like you make this project a success. You allow us to build our studio. You allow us to travel. You allow us to do bigger and bigger explorations. And so to those of you who already support us, thank you. Thank we you. We could not do this without you. It is such a blessing. For everybody who doesn't support us, what are you waiting for? And if you if you can't afford a couple dollars, that's totally cool. Just share the podcast with somebody. Get down in the comments. Tell us what you think. Tell us who we should talk to next. And I think you can rate us on Spotify and Apple in these places. I have no idea how that works. If you have the opportunity to do so, uh, give us five stars. <laughs> Only five stars. Don't, don't leave reviews for lower than that. <laughs> Email us directly. We'll fix it. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye. The scientific revolution starts now. The <laughs> Let us see you later. You're a part-time rock star, aren't you? <laughs> uh, very part-time, yeah. Um, so I play with uh, Constantine, which I imagine is how you um, heard about me. But mm. um, You came highly yeah, recommended. We, yes, <laughs> thanks. Well, um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I got to know Constantine as a postdoc at, at Caltech, and we work on, you know, very similar uh, stuff. So I do mostly observations of exoplanets, and he's a theory guy. So, um, you know, we started working together and realized that we both, you know, loved rock music and started playing together. So um, we've played a couple of shows, you know, nothing too, uh, nothing too big. Um, Although the last, the last, the very last flight I took pre-COVID was to play a show with him at the uh, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. Oh, right. Um, and you know, on the way up, there was you know there were people like sanitizing the plane, you know, um, and doing all of this sort of crazy stuff in my mind. And uh, little did I know that a few days later, you know, we'd all be doing that as well. Uh, so this was literally in the in the days leading up to lockdown. Interesting. So. Um, no more shows yeah. on the horizon for you guys or, um, we're actually, yeah. So we're, we're practicing tomorrow um, oh, cool. and we've got a new drummer. So we're, we're trying to get it started up again. Nice. Um, a couple things have happened, you know, in the meantime, like, you know, my, my newborn is now three and, you know, uh, the drummer has got a kid. So, you know, this is, these are sort of, the um, the, the, the issues with, with being in a dad rock band is that, you know, you got, you got kind of childcare responsibilities. <laughs> Got that curfew going now, yeah. That's right. That's right. Getting getting away for, uh, especially like flying anywhere is, is a little more challenging. But yes. Uh, you play bass, by the way? Is that right? Or I play guitar. You play guitar, play guitar also. Guitar. Okay. But uh, yeah, started learning the bass as well. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I'm still hoping maybe we catch you guys one of these days when okay. we're down that way. Yeah, we're going to be yeah. there at the end of December. So if you have anything planned, <laughs> you'll have to let us know. Okay, great. Awesome. We'll come by and say hi. Do you, so with like in terms of your science, do you, do you keep do you, do you separate your worlds of art and science completely or do you feel like there's an overlap? Uh, I feel like it's it's pretty separate, honestly. I mean, I, for for me, 
Um, I mean, obviously you can make, you can force a meta- metaphor wherever, wherever you want. Right. I mean, there's planetary resonances and there's, uh, you know, resonances in music. Um, but I mean, honestly, for, for me, it's sort of, it's the, um, just the difference in approach, right? When I'm writing a paper or I'm, or I'm doing an analysis, I need to make sure that, you know, not only is everything written correct, but everything that's behind the words is correct too, right? The code that didn't go into the paper, the observations that, you know, you're only seeing one figure of that. Um, and so it's very sort of detail oriented. And even when you've done, you know, you've triple checked everything, um, there's always this nagging concern that you've made some error somewhere that's, you know, somebody's going to find later on and, you know, you're going to be super embarrassed. Um, so that's, that's kind of the science end of it. And what I love so much about music and, and the type of music that we play is that, um, you know, no one cares. And on, oftentimes like the best, the best, uh, versions of a song are ones with, you know, mistakes in them. Um, those and, jazz notes, gotta get those jazz notes. In. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's, that's kind of where it fits into my life where, um, you know, people are, are generally happy if, uh, you know, you can play a few songs on your guitar, you don't have to be that, that difficult. And, um, yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way about cooking, honestly, too. So I do a lot of cooking at home and it's like, you know, it, there's very, there are many ways to make, you know, people happy with, uh, with a home cooked meal. Um, you don't have to have everything right. So, um, it's kind of a nice counterpoint. Do do you find that with... science is like unforgiving? Have you seen these mistakes happen? And is there a way for people to remediate their mistakes in a way that doesn't cause egg on their face? Or, um, that's yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I, and I, I think it's it's a matter of degree, right? So, um, obviously, you want you you don't want to be so scared of making a mistake that you never publish anything right like at, sometimes you have to stick your neck out and say based on the available data based on my own intuition about how the universe works i'm going to stick my neck out and make a make a prediction about what's going on in the system or how a particular planet forms something like that um and you know like if you're completely wrong, you can publish an erratum. Um, you know, that, that is a little embarrassing. So you hope to not do that too often. Um, but there's, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely a mechanism for people to, to make, make mistakes and kind of correct them in a, um, an honorable way. Um, there are lots of examples in the field of extrasolar planets, um, where things like that have, have happened. Um, there's a very famous example before my time, uh, back in the early nineties when people were looking for planets around pulsars. So the first, the first planet ever discover was, um, was a, a, a low mass planet around a pulsar. And these were, um, detected by the, um, the pulse timing variation. So pulsars have, are a very sort of regular clock. And if they're being tugged by the, um, by orbiting planet, the, the, time between those pulses will change. And because you can measure times very accurately, um, you know, this was a way to detect low mass planets. And so there was a, there was one group that claimed to have detected a planet around a pulsar with a one year orbital period. And um, this got a lot of attention. It turns out that um, that was not a, a, they had not found a planet. They had just basically rediscovered the earth's orbit. Whoa. You detect planets in this way, you have to subtract out the orbit of the Earth because we're using, um, you know, the variation in the line of sight velocity to a planet. And so in order to um, to measure that what's going on for the star, you need to subtract out what the Earth is doing. So you need to take into account that the Earth is rotating and also orbiting around the star. And so it turns out that this team made a mistake in how they, they, they subtracted out the or- orbit of the Earth and, um, you know, incorrectly uh, found a, an earth, you know, an earth orbit planet. Um, and, you know, again, I wasn't there, but, um, there was apparently a meeting, um, uh, you know, an ex or an astronomy meeting where they kind of got up and, uh, explained their mistake and, you know, people gave them a standing ovation for their, Oh, wow. Um, fourth, forthrightness and, uh, just being, being able to, um, you know, show their, show their work, show their error. And, and, you know, the field grew as a result of that. So, um, so I guess that that's, that's kind of the, that's kind of the extreme, right? You know, you don't want to be publishing garbage all the time because then you'll lose all of your credibility, but sometimes you kind of have to stick your neck out a little bit. Um, 
So, yeah, it just seems like when it comes to big, highly prized discoveries, like no one's ever walked back on a Nobel Prize, which kind of makes me nervous. Like, is it even possible for fundamental assumptions to be revisited when you have people getting awarded prizes by kings and these huge, you know, we just had uh, Brian Keating on the show talking about his losing the Nobel Prize book. And uh, it it just occurred to us that uh, we have at least, not that it's happened, but there's a potential danger of walling ourselves off into certain paradigms as a result of, uh, you know, these these awards that don't seem to have any recourse to them. I don't know. Maybe it is possible to walk back on a Nobel yeah. Prize. Yeah. I mean, when you, yeah, when you said we've, ne- a Nobel Prize has never been retracted. I, I, you know, I don't know all of the, the Nobel Prizes by heart, but I, I can't think of any counterexamples. I'm looking, um, I, I'm yeah. looking because he said that and I was like, God, is that true? And it does appear to be correct. I mean, like, uh, no, they've no, literally, never, yeah. they've never been like, hey, that was not, that discovery turned out to not be correct. Yeah, yeah. it might be true. I, think but. I mean, uh, one, one example, I don't know if this is, if this is strictly true, but, you know, there are oftentimes sort of series of Nobel Prizes that build on one another. So I think that um, Niels Bohr um, won a Nobel Prize for the Bohr model of the atom and, you know, that's actually not that's not correct right it's it's sort of a, a a good stepping stone beyond what was you know the previous state of the art but it's it's nowhere near what we think the atom actually um how the atom behaves and so you know additional um uh advances by you know people like schrodinger and heisenberg um all of that is sort of building building on that but i don't think anyone looked back and said you know the Bohr model is is useless. Like it's it was just sort that's of that's the key. Yeah, that's the key. It's useful, right? Despite the fact that it's incorrect, it's the schematization of it is technologically useful for chemistry and electronics and so forth. It's a uh, it's still really being taught in intro chemistry books, more or less, okay. um, because it's so useful. I think that's probably why it stood the test of time. Yeah. But it, yeah, but it seems like if it failed in its utility at some point, like if it was leading us astray, technology well, does lead us astray at some point, right? That's why quantum mechanics is the model that people use when they're actually doing engineering rather than the Bohr model. And so I think that yeah, I guess yeah. so. And so it's something that's really interesting that happens in science where there usually isn't a point where people come right out and are like, "Hey, we were wrong." Like I don't know if you noticed, but people stopped really using the term fossil fuels. Hmm. And I think that that's directly related to astronomy because people started to realize that long chain hydrocarbons were abundant throughout the universe, probably from abiotic sources. Like the serpentinization stuff. Yeah, but it's just like the there was just this quiet shift to be like, okay, well, hydrocarbons probably didn't exclusively all come from the dinosaurs. But nobody ever came out to be like, hey, you know, there's been this new discovery, and so we have to shift the way that we're thinking about it. And so it's like, perhaps we were incorrect. It, it just, it's like, it's not in the style of science to necessarily like come right out and be like, hey, our theories might not have been right. I think because people look at them as the best attempt to explain, right? Like, that's all we're doing at any given moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, everybody probably has some... Uh, cross section with this and probably some opinion about this, but, you know, we all got to see science occur, you know, in a very sort of prominent way during the COVID pandemic. Um, and, you know, there people got to see, you know, our understanding of a new virus change on a month to month basis. And it was, you know, the things that, you know, even people with a scientific background like myself that were, you know, that we were doing, at the beginning of, of the pandemic just makes zero sense given what we know about the virus today. You know, like I remember, uh, you know, wiping down like, you know, all of the groceries I got because, you know, there was this fear that it could be on surfaces and that's, that's probably not true. Um, and so I think that, you know, somebody who, who lives, you know, who, who kind of, um, inhabits a scientific space, you know, we're, we're fairly, used to our knowledge changing over time right and with with covid the stakes were very high and um there were a lot of people working on you know preventative measures and uh, public health measures and stuff so this so everything moved very fast 
But, you know, in talking to, um, to, you know, many of my friends and, you know, family members, there's this sort of like almost like anger or feeling like betrayed that uh, people were told to do things that weren't actually, you know, uh, what, they're not what you would do today, knowing what we know now. Um, and so, you know, things like, um, you know, mask wearing in, in certain contexts, right. You know, there, it makes sense in some, but not in others. And, you know, I think a, a lot of people just are, um, are upset that they were doing things that, um, you know, th- that the recommendations have changed over time. That doesn't bother me so much because that's sort of a natural process of science, right? You start from a place of ignorance, you know, you do experiments, you make observations and you arrive at some better conclusions. So I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these people that's like looking for an apology from, from Anthony Fauci or something like that. I, I assume that people, you know, did the best they could with the, with the information that they had at the time. Um, but, and it gets blown up um, by the different, like figureheads that are talking to the public right like they'll say things like you know as soon as we have this prophylactic it's gonna be over you know and everybody yeah, who's exactly. actually an immunologist is like whoa, 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 whoa. like that's <laughs> not how respiratory viruses work we've actually not been able to eradicate a respiratory but like stop saying stuff like that you know but the, the like yeah. I, one thing i found was that the literature was much more cautious about its statements than the stuff that made it to John Q. Public. We were teaching yeah. an immunology of COVID class. So we taught it twice. We taught it once right at the beginning of the pandemic, and we taught it again a year later. And it was amazing because a year later, there was this paper that was talking about detection methods. And they were going through all of the different ways, and they're like, we actually think that PCR might be the worst way to detect things and that there's like a tremendous difficulty of using it, but it's the gold standard. And so, but, and they listed all of these other, other methods where they were like, look, like protein based methods and these lateral flow methods, things that are perhaps a little bit slower, but you can do them point of contact or better. But it was weird to see the disconnect between the scientific literature where people who were actually spending all of their time thinking about it, the ways that that was lost when it came out into the world and advisories were funneled into the most narrow possible soundbite that you could get out in a single sentence. Yeah. I mean, I think we see this, I mean, especially with like in the life sciences and I, I, you know, we're kind of uh, straying away from my, you know, my, my expertise, but you know, one thing that, that you hear is, you know, in the public is just, you know, Hey, we found a cure for such and such, or we haven't found a cure. We need to find a cure for such and such. Um, and a lot of things, you know, a lot of advances, you know, are just very incremental and you feel like you're not making progress, but you look back after 20 years of work and, you know, you realize you've come a long way. And so like, you know, HIV, HIV medication is, is one of these things where, you know, the eighties, like HIV was a death sentence. And then, you know, slowly over time, nobody cured it, but the, um, you know, the cocktails that they were developing, um, got it to the point where, you know, transmission went down and people could live, you know, and be HIV positive. Um, so there wasn't just like one magical cure, but there's certainly been, you know, a lot of, a lot of progress over time. Um, and I think, yeah, COVID is probably a, a similar thing where, you know, the vaccines, you know, uh, help, but they're not perfect. The, um, you know, the therapies help, but they're not perfect, right? You know, the vaccines are uh, behind the current variant, you know, so it's, it's all sort of um, partial solutions. But, you know, to think that there's going to be like, you know, one pill that, you know, everyone's going to be able to afford and just take it and be completely protected for life. That's, you know, (laughs) that's probably not coming. Do you find that astronomy is a a somewhat safer field for that? Because it seems like the paradigms in astronomy just over the last maybe 20 years that I've been paying attention, there's been all sorts of fascinating paradigm shifts particularly in planetary formation uh in in that kind of lead back to our own understanding of our planet and because they're not tied to any particular crisis like there's no you know the world's not going to fall apart if we change our understanding of planet formation yeah i mean that's i think that's that's why yeah that's probably why i mean in some ways you know people uh you know are are a little bit separated from you know, what's going on on a, on a planet around another star, right? I mean, it's um, obviously, like, we, we need to understand these things to understand how we got here. 
Um, but no one has sort of a visceral knee-jerk reaction to, you know, a hot Jupiter or, you know, a, a, a resonant configuration of, of planets. I mean, there's this. probably like five people in a room somewhere that do have the visceral response, but yeah. they probably... Maybe not in one room. Maybe not in one room, yeah. There's like one person per room per continent. Yes, there we go. Um, yeah, so, I mean, in my field and... Um, you know, I've only really been been doing this for about 10 years, but, um, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of witnessing, you know, several paradigm shifts in, in extrasolar planet research. Um, and the biggest one was the, um, was brought about by the Kepler mission. So, you know, prior to Kepler, people were finding planets uh, using primarily the, the Doppler method, which is using the stellar wobble um, and using the Doppler effect to measure the stellar wobble. And, you know, this, this method was very good at finding uh, massive planets, um, particularly close in massive planets, but, you know, also extending out to Jupiter. Um, and so I remember, you know, right when I was getting into to exoplanets and astronomy, you know, the, the sort of the paradigm, if you will, was, you know, how exactly did the Jovian planets form out beyond the ice line, you know, where Jupiter is today and how did they migrate in and what were the properties of the protoplanetary disk that allowed them to migrate in? How did they get parked, you know, where the hot Jupiters are? So people were just, you know, spending all of their brain power thinking about migration and moving giant planets around. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is that these models were tuned to explain the giant planet population, right? You had to get the properties of the disk just right. You had to get the, um, you know, the, the, not only the mass of the disk, but the sort of dependence of mass on distance just right. You had to get the, you know, viscosity parameter. Um, and if you sort of take those models at face value and you say, okay, like, let's assume those are exactly right. How, you know, what's the prospect of finding Neptune sized planets in several day orbits? Um, what's the property? Uh, you know, probability of finding Earth-like planets or Earth-mass planets in, in several-day orbits. And so these models were predicting that, you know, the, the sort of effects that were bringing the Jovians in and, and getting them close would just completely drain away the smaller planets. The, the migration would just be so efficient and there would be a small planet desert. So this is something that, you know, you'd see in talks, you'd see in colloquia, somebody would show a plot, you know, of you know, the exoplanet, the predicted exoplanet population from Kepler, and they would say, ah, Kepler's not going to find very much at all. And then, you know, Kepler comes along and, um, you know, shows that the vast majority of planets are in the desert. And in fact, the things that we could see before were just planets that happened to be, um, you know, above our detection threshold. And so people were kind of getting really worked up about these giant planets, which are really only a few percent of the population. And then Kepler comes along and says, basically every star has a small close in planet. Um, and so that was just an immediate sort of paradigm shift. And, you know, people still talk about migration to explain some, some planets, you know, it's, it's not exactly, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it's wrong. Um, it's just not the, it doesn't seem to be, uh, the, the most important process in the formation of most planets. Hmm. Um, now, you know, to your point about, um, whether or not there was resistance to this, I, I don't think that there really was. I think that the data from Kepler were just, was just so compelling, right? You know, it's easy to explain away a few planets, but when you get 4,000, mm, you know, you kind of have to, um, <laughs> to move on. So I, I don't really, you know, thinking back and, you know, I was a graduate student at the time, but I think people were very, very quick to sort of think creatively about new theories. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I, you know, I really enjoy working in the field of exoplanets is that, you know, it's just, it's so fast moving that um, you kind of have to be, you, there isn't time for, uh, you know, kind of accepted wisdom to really calcify um, and become immovable. And so there are definitely examples of, of, you know, sort of, commonly held theories that have been just upended. Um, and that's very exciting. Is that because our, our limits of detection are shifting so quickly? Yes. Yes. So um, the types of planets that we routinely discover these days, you know, were unheard of uh, 10 years ago. So, you know, 
10, 10 years ago, you know, people got really excited. I should, all right. 12 years ago, <laughs> 12 years ago, people got so excited about, you know, finding a Neptune, a Neptune sized planet. And, you know, these days, uh, you know, the test mission is finding, you know, one of these planets, you know, every, <laughs> every six hours, you know, um, it's just, it, this is, uh, um, it's a totally different world that we live in. And now we get excited about, you know, earth sized planets. Um, that's kind of where our, our current detection limits are. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting sort of continuum between the, the super earths and the Neptunes. I, I was reading a paper the other day that was trying to make sense. Uh, I guess there's a small radius gap in the super earths that they were trying to explain, but it seems like the composition of the cores of some of the, like the, that, that, uh, the, the Neptunes, some of them are evaporating at such a rate that they, they would essentially leave behind something rocky looking eventually. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is something that I've, I've sort of been obsessed, um, with for the last like five years or so. Um, and you know, I was, I was part of the team that, um, discovered the, the radius gap initially. Um, and so this is, you know, um, and just kind of give some some background to this. So, you know, Kepler found this huge population of of uh, you know four thousand or so planets, and at the time, you know the um, the limiting precision with which we could measure the size of the planet was dictated by the the size of the star. So, um, you know, Kepler is a very precise instrument. It detects planets by the transit technique, and that tells you the the relative size between planet and star. But if you don't know the size of the star, you don't know the size of the planet. And so I was part of a team that, you know, very painstakingly went, you know, went off and, and got spectra of over a thousand stars, you know, that hosted over 2000 planets and just, you know, could, gathered that data so that we could measure the sizes of the stars um, ever more precisely. And so um, by making these observations, we were able to improve the precision from about 40%. Um, so that's a fairly large kind of fractional error to about 10%, which is much better. It's, um, you know, basically shrinking the error bars by a factor of four. And um, when we did that, we saw that what initially seemed to be a single population of planets that was kind of smoothly ranged from Earth to Neptune size was actually two populations of planets. And these are what's now, these are the, the you know, the planets that are now called super Earths and sub Neptunes. And they're separated by this region of low planet occurrence, which is called the radius gap. Um, so that was a super, um, just super exciting discovery. Um, just because, you know, it's whenever, whenever nature gives you, you know, a strong feature like that in the population, like, you know, this radius gap, um, you know, there are many, there are many of mo- models of planet formation that don't produce a radius gap. Um, and, you know, why is the radius gap at the size that we observe it today? That that's basically saying that there's some sort of preferred size scale in the formation of planets. And so basically anytime nature gives you some sort of sharp feature or some bifurcation or some natural division between two classes of objects, um, you know, you got to go after that. Um, and so that's I've such been a, that's that so for, rare. That you get like a sh- yeah. stark feature? Yeah, because usually like I'm always of the opinion, I, I mean, usually I look at nature and I can have the opinion where I'm like, look, the binary that we've set upon this is a binary that we have invented and it is an mm-hmm. artifact of the way that we're looking at the system because you move your like bounds. Like the difference between one species and the next. Or yeah, like yeah. species and biology. I remember we were having a podcast with this guy, Milton Love from UC Santa Barbara, and he's a marine biologist. And he was talking about these different species of rockfish. And then he started talking about half and half rockfish. And it turned out that mm-hmm. like the delineation of species in rockfish is basically meaningless because they can all interbreed. Mm-hmm. And so you can mm-hmm. get like a rockfish that's literally 50-50 by appearance yep. like there's a line down the middle and so to see something but like not these with, things with the exoplanets that's so discreet must have just been astounding yeah has it helped i mean it doesn't it doesn't come across yeah i mean you know things like this don't come across very often i mean another another example that i can think of would be the difference between dwarf and giant stars so you know if you go out into the night sky and you just kind of look at the stars right you'll see some of them are blue some of them are red some of them are white right they kind of have this continuum of color and we understand that those colors are, are due to different temperatures. But, you know, when people started taking spectra of these stars, they realized that, ah, 
you know, a, a star could have the same broadband color. You know, you could have a star that looks red. But if you take a detailed spectrum, you could have two different red stars that have different features in their spectra. Hmm, that's, that's something interesting. Um, and what that's showing us, it's telling us is that, you know, one type of red star is, you know, would be a dwarf and just kind of in its sort of normal middle-aged life. And another type of red star is one that's evolved off the main sequence onto the giant branch and is at the end of its life. And, you know, these stars look very similar to our eyes, but if you, if you observe them with a more sensitive instrument, you can very clearly tell the difference. Mm. Um, and so a, a bifurcation like that is, you know, is really telling. Um, and to find, to find something like that in the exoplanet world um, was, was a big deal. Um, so yeah, you know, in, over the last five years since since we discovered that, um, you know, I've been I've been working on several projects to sort of understand those two populations of planets, um, project them along different dimensions to so say like look at how those populations evolve with um, stellar composition or stellar age or stellar mass, and try to see how um, how that agrees with predictions from models. So um, there's definitely clear patterns, but I would say that, you know, we haven't quite fully interpreted the patterns, mm. the patterns yet. Well, uh, as I recall, there, the paper that I read was suggesting that there might have been, uh, they were actually invoking, I believe, some migration ideas into what would de like either destroy that population in the radius gap. Um, maybe some of these Neptunes were cr crunching into each other. What, yeah. What's the, where are you at so with that? There are a whole host of theories that explain this population. There's a whole host of them. And I, you know, I don't think that there's any, you know, any convergence yet. Um, so, you know, there are, I actually, I was just looking up this, this thing last night. So the original paper that we, that we published the radius gap in has, you know, 700 citations now. And it's, you know, many of those are theory papers that are trying to explain this, this, uh, this radius gap. Um, and so some of them, um, use uh, what's called, broadly speaking, thermally driven mass loss. So you have some some sort of process that heats the gas, heats the the envelope of a planet, and drives a wind. And you know various mass loss processes. Um, when you study them, you can show that they're like a threshold process. So they're either negligible or they're complete, but they're not mm. sort of in between. Um, and so the outcome of these processes is either you kind of, you know, blow off a little bit of the gas or you blow off all of it. And that's how you get those two populations at the end. Um, <clears throat> but even among people that think that um, this thermally driven mass loss is is what's sculpting the population of super Earths and sub-Neptunes, um, there's there's disagreement as to, you know, what's powering that. So, you know, some theories say, Hey, the, you know, the star is supplying the energy that's blowing off the, uh, the gas and others theories say, Hey, you know, the core of these newborn planets should be really hot mm. and that energy has to leak out somehow. And when it leaks out, it kind of takes the, the gas with it. So that's only sort of one, that's sort of disagreement among just a subset of these theories, but there's, there's plenty of other theories that explain, the radius gap as well. Um, one thing, Michael, that you were you were alluding to was an, another theory that says, you know, hey, maybe these planets form in these like very tightly packed resonant chains, and then something destabilizes this configuration, and you have planets merging into other planets, and the uh, the energetics of those mergers can can also unbind the envelopes and you know produce planets that are stripped or you know the planets that didn't collide have still have their envelopes. Um, there are other theories that say, you know, Hey, there's some sort of process that produces icy cores versus rocky cores. And that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, so it's, you know, there's really just a, uh, a diversity of interpretations and, you know, I have my, you know, I have my favorite set of models, but, um, you know, I'm not willing to, to really kind of, uh, vouch for one too strongly at this point, because, um, the pattern is clear, but the cause is, is not that's clear. The, that's the most exciting uh, regions of science, in my opinion, where, where there's lots of different uh, possibilities and we're still trying to narrow them down. Maybe something we haven't even thought of. My, uh, what would those planets, if they go like whole hog and evaporate their entire 
those Neptunes, would they leave behind something that looked like Mercury or like looked like a moon, like Enceladus or something? What would it? What, what are they going to make hypothetically? Yeah. Well, that yeah, that's a great question. Um, the the difference the um, these different theories predict different kind of remnant populations. And it really comes down to where these planets form in the first place. So, you know, people who study exoplanets are oftentimes, you know, just saying, hey, you know, we, we want to figure out where these planets formed. You know, do they form, you know, out kind of in, in the region where Jupiter is in our own solar system? Or do they form, uh, you know, where we see them today? Um, and the the composition of these remnant cores may be the clue to figure to understanding where they formed in the first place. So we think that if planets form where we see them today, if they form close in, there shouldn't be very much ice or, um, you know, anything other than rock and, and metal there. Because in the inner part of a, um, a protoplanetary disk, you know, the region where planets form, um, it's very hot. And so it's so hot that, you know, you wouldn't have water in, in solid form. It would just all be gas. Um, so if planets form there, then we expect sort of dry, you know, balls of rock and, and metal. Um, if you go farther out, right, if you go toward Jupiter, then, you know, you're right, you're going to start to see lots more, a lot of more ices, like, you know, Enceladus would be a good um, example of something like that. And so if these planets, in fact, migrate in um, from from distant regions, we may expect to, to find um, lots of ices and, and water in these remnant uh, cores. That now, can... there, there are a number of, of systems where we've actually measured the mass and radius very precisely and have been able to, you know, confidently determine that they're, that they're rock and iron. So, you know, for some, for some planets, it's an open question, but for others, uh, we just have direct measurements that, that at least constrain the, the types of things that could be made out of. This is something that I've been wondering about a lot lately, because we've been talking a lot of astrophysics and astronomy. How do you know what something in a different solar system is made out of? Is it just density or? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the first order thing. Um, so in the absence of, of anything else, um, you know, what, what we can do is measure the size of a planet with, um, the size of its transit and the mass of the planet with, um, the amount it tugs on its host star through the, the Doppler method. So that gives you mass and it gives you radius. And so you can combine those things to get density but you can kind of sense that that's a pretty crude, pretty crude measurement, right? So you could say, hey, you know, this planet, say, is the density of Earth, which is, you know, five, uh, you know, 5.4 grams per cubic centimeter, or it's the density of Saturn, you know, uh, which is less than one gram per cubic centimeter. So you get sort of a rough idea of, of what something it's made out of. But you could imagine very clearly, if you had, say, like three different um, constituents of a planet, say you had, you know, iron, rock, and ice, right? All of those materials have different densities. And you could imagine trading, say, you know, iron for ice or rock for iron and doing doing this sort of trade-off in a way that you make a planet the same density with which is various admixtures of these three components. And that's just if you're thinking of three things, right? If you have more, it becomes even more degenerate. So what we typically measure is just density, and we have to infer uh, what are the possible things that could be in that planet and, you know, what range of, of compositions are consistent with that density. But sometimes it's not possible to get a, a unique answer. So when you say something is definitely an iron exclusive core on this, on this planet, how, are you saying that because there's no way ice could exist there? or? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the systems where we have the best where we can most confidently say they're rock and iron are the planets that are so close to their host star that there's just no way ice could exist on those planets at all. It would just get, you know, evaporated. It would get, you know, turned from ice into steam and then the steam would get blown off. Mm -hmm. um, so planets, planets that are that close, right? Really the only things that are, are possibilities are rock and iron. And so there you have two you know, two uh, materials and you have two measurements, a mass and a radius. And so you can uniquely determine the amount of rock and iron in the planet, um, in the planetary system. But the second you get out beyond that, it's, you know, it'd be the, the ice line or, or a, a region where, 
where ISIS can exist, then you have to start thinking about more, more than just two components. And then, you know, you have to deal with degeneracies. Mm -hmm. Is that ice line? Uh, is that ice line in our soul? follow up, just to follow up on the, um, the other ways in which we can address composition of planets. Um, so I, I mentioned the sort of bulk composition, but, um, another thing you can do is measure the composition of the atmosphere. And that's something that's becoming a lot more um, accessible in the last year or so with the James Webb. Um, so the James Webb Space Telescope has the sensitivity to um, to detect atmospheric features in the in the um, transits of, of exoplanets. And so you can say, oh, in the atmosphere of this planet, there's, you know, say something like carbon dioxide or methane or carbon monoxide or water. And so looking at those molecules you get a sense of what's in the atmosphere. So that's another observable that we're sort of just beginning to, to have a lot more sensitivity of. There was some stuff we could, we could have done with, um, with Hubble Space Telescope, but really um, James Webb is, is just so much more sensitive. So that, mm. that kind of area is going to see an explosion in the next couple of years. So when it comes to these techniques, everything's tied pretty tightly to the host star. But mm -hmm. there was a couple articles... I want to say it was maybe two years ago at this point about like rogue planets and Chthonian planets, which are wandering between stars. Do you mm -hmm. have a sense for, for what percentage of planets are in solar system versus those that are just kind of, you know, loosey goosey wandering? Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, I, I refer to them mostly as rogue planets, but, um, yeah. So, you know, these planets are very hard to detect um, because they're not next to any star. Um, if they're old, they have since cooled down, and so they're very dim. Um, so these planets are found basically with two techniques. So one is with a technique called microlensing. So if you have a, a planet and it just happens to go um, nearby a very distant background star, what you might see is the, the gravitational effect of that planet, um, you know, bending the light and magnifying the background star. So that's, that's microlensing. And um, microlensing can detect rogue, rogue planets. Now, it doesn't tell you very much about any given one because, it, you know, these, these events where they kind of go near um, or they're close to aligned with a background star are very rare. And once those events happen, they're gone. So you don't get to follow up those planets. So you basically see like a little blip and you say, oh, okay, that was a, you know, a 10 earth mass planet that uh, was there and we're never going to see it again. Um, so that's, that's one way to, to, to study these rogue planets. Um, and that's where our, our understanding of their prevalence comes from is from these microlensing surveys. And, you know, you got to sort of imagine that this is a pretty hard um, measurement to make, right? Because you're talking about, inferring the 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 abundance of things that you only see once right and then they go away so you know you have to detect many of them right and you have to make sure that you uh aren't being confused by contaminating sources like other things that cause stars to go blip you don't you don't want those to be falsely counted as planets um so anyway the the error bars on these on these measurements of rogue planets are pretty large but roughly it's about one planet per star Mm -hmm. So there's about as many rogue planets as there are bound planets. Oh. Um, and to me, that's not all that surprising. Um, so, you know, if you imagine like the early days of the solar system, right, you've got Jupiter, you've got Saturn. Well, actually, our own solar system is a bad example because we're, we're in a very dynamically cool conf configuration. Um, but let's imagine another solar system. So another solar system that had, say, multiple giant planets forming at the same time. Those planets might interact with one another. They might kind of tug on each other and excite their um, orbital eccentricity, their ellipticity. And eventually one may just have such an intense encounter with another one that it's just flung off and becomes unbound from the solar system. Um, you know, Jupiter and Saturn aren't going to do that because they're on very sort of circular orbits and they don't really get that close to one another. But if you were able to move Saturn into the right orbital configuration, Jupiter has enough uh, gravity to basically launch Saturn out and, uh, you know, send it, send it, you know, uh, to interstellar space. So um, my sense is that these kind of instabilities happen pretty commonly around other, um, 
in other solar systems. And there's, there's actually a lot of evidence um, in the planets that remain that these in- instabilities are quite common. So, um, is it so, yeah, possible for them for, in a some solar system for me? This is probably a really stupid question, so forgive me. But is it possible that th- that some of the planets that we see in new solar systems are grabbing them from the external pool? Oh, so like the rogue planets oh, are like, like getting captured, captured planets. Hmm. Um, that's very that's very rare. Um, I think it's it's possible, um, and. Because like you run into the stability, like the stability question seems to be what this is all based on. Like how how difficult is it to stabilize a really nice circular-ish orbit, right? Shyla's teaching yeah, astronomy yeah. this semester. Oh, oh. I'm about it. He's done a lot. I just of have I have questions. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> okay. So so it's very hard to capture a planet, um, and here's here's why, right? If you imagine uh, perturbing the planet to the point where you send it out and you basically eject it from the solar system, right? It's got to be moving at a fairly high velocity, right? Because it's, it's exceeded the escape velocity of the solar system. And so when it encounters another solar system, right, that high velocity is going to cause it to basically just zip by and not get, and not get captured. Mm. Now, okay. You could, you could concoct, some scenario where you maybe have like a binary star system and you kind of have multiple interactions and it, and it's coming in just below the threshold of, of, uh, you know, or sorry, like just above the, the escape velocity so that when it, it gets captured by that, that first, um, when it gets deflected by that first star, it's now like within the escape velocity of that other system and it gets, um, capture I guess it could way. crunch into somebody too. Well, it could. Oh, but what if it also leaves from a smaller star and ends up with a larger star? Well, I mean that that generally wouldn't wouldn't work. Um, it's you know what you have to remember is that you know in space there's no friction, right? So if something is is flying, you know, is is moving, you know, through space, n- nothing's going to slow it down, right? It's just going to keep going. So the only, so when it, when you have an object that encounters a star, right, if you, you know, you might think like, oh, hey, that when it goes near the star, it's going to get slowed down by that star's gravity and get captured. But before it, it gets slowed down, it's going to get sped up because it's coming toward that star and the star's gravity is, uh, is working on it, you know, on both ends. So if you just have a single flyby, there's no way to get a capture. Mm. The only way to capture something is to have multiple multiple interactions. Mm. So I think this is possible. I I remember hearing that um, one of the pulsar planets that that have been found. um, So this is going back to what we were talking about earlier. um, You know, the pulsar planets were the first that were found, but there haven't been that many of them discovered since then. It was kind of like a a lucky fluke that the first, the first couple planets were pulsar planets. Um, But there have been a, a handful that have been discovered since 1992. And, I remember hearing that one of them is is a candidate for being captured. I, I forget exactly the reason why, but the idea is that you know this 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 could have been a rogue planet that was captured by a mm. by a pulsar, a binary pulsar. Because even within our own solar system, it seems like there's some there's definitely some oddballs, right? Like we got Uranus rotating on its side, Venus going the wrong way. Like it seems like there's definitely been some change ups in the past or something. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. I guess like maybe they've gotten whacked by other planets or. And isn't the distribution of momentum through the solar system weird too? Well, that that's a whole other issue. Like why the sun isn't, isn't spinning as fast as everybody. Yeah. So like with the, with the formation of the solar system, is there Mm -hmm. any chance that the weirdness of the planets suggests a different origin story? I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of, one of the central <laughs> questions. Like, I'd love to be able to answer that right now. I, I could retire. Um, so that's, yeah. Well, let's I mean, do it right now. I get, that's what I get up every morning, like thinking about. Um, so, you know, we know that exoplanet, exoplanetary systems have a huge range of diversity. Um, and, you know, just kind of like to, uh, for a little personal context, like, you know, I, I got into astronomy very young before the first extrasolar planets were, were being found. And there was this whole question, right? Like if you, if you popped open like a popular science book, like cosmos or something, you know, and you page through it, you know, there'd be sort of, uh, you know, speculation like, Hey, you know, 
there are probably planets around other stars, but like, do they all look like the solar system? Do they all have small planets close in and gas giant planets farther out? Or are there systems that are all mixed up that have, you know, giant planets close in and, and small planets far out? Um, and just at that time, people didn't know. Um, and these days we know that the solar system is just one of many possible outcomes. Um, and in some sense, the solar system is kind of weird, is kind of rare um, compared to other other so, um, solar systems. And that is, you know, super fascinating to me because, you know, what is it, you know, about the solar system that, that makes it an oddball, right? I mean, um, and, you know, is that connected in any way to our own origin, right? Like, does the presence of multiple giant planets, you know, uh, have some bearing on the origin of life on the earth, for example, um, you know, does the period of instability in the early solar system, like, does that help deliver water to the, to the inner solar system? And, and again, you know, help, help seed the earth's oceans. So these are, these are like the big questions. And, um, I wish I had an answer for you, but that's, that's what we're working on uh, every day here. Well, like, yeah, the, the retrograde orbits just are really fascinating to me uh, and the retrograde rotation because they just seem to suggest a time when things were different. Like something happened, like it just seems like something happened, you know, and and it's, of course, like open, you know, and I don't think anyone's ever going to be able to say for, with any certainty what that was exactly, but... Uh, yeah, well, we don't we don't have retrograde orbits. Oh, oh they, there's so moons. I, I mean, the moons of yeah, uh, the moons of Saturn moons, and yeah. stuff. Yeah, some, um, some of the moons of Saturn. Yeah, are retrograde. I mean, I think those are pretty those are pretty well understood. Which is just that they're they're captured. Yeah, moons. they're captured. Yeah. So, um, so you know, you've got some you know you've got some Kuiper Belt object that gets stirred up a little bit and it gets sent near Saturn and you know it has an interaction with Saturn and maybe you know one of Saturn's existing moons and it gets captured. Um, Jupiter has a whole bunch of retrograde moons as well. Um, but, but they stabilize know, they're... really quickly. That's what's really interesting. Like they do form these nice elliptical orbits even after being captured, which is, is pretty tantalizing. Um, yeah, in terms of just like the question we were talking about before, like could a planet get captured by a solar system? It's like, so I've often heard people well, yeah. Yeah, argue against it. Like, well, you couldn't stabilize an orbit like that. And I don't know. It just seems like Saturn's pulled it off. Like, I don't know, maybe on some bigger scale, it would be possible for a, a full exoplanet or a full rogue planet or something. Yeah. I, it's, it's possible. It's just rare. Right. Right. right, right so, right, right. you know, you know, you, you are only seeing the end results of the successful captures into mm. retrograde orbits. Right. So, you know, you look at, you look at Saturn and say, Oh, there's a few retrograde moons, you know, that just shows that it's possible, but it doesn't show how likely it is. Right. There may have been many, moons that came in um with more unstable orbits that mm. you know got uh uh in just shoved into saturn or mm. you know kicked out again and now they're, they're oh, man, that's or something else that's such an interesting general pattern too like everything we see is only what survived you know from an evolutionary perspective even the solar mm -hmm. systems we see like how many solar systems start off and just live like just don't work out very quickly or something that we we aren't able yeah. to account for well I, that's something yeah i mean that's something that i haven't worked personally on very much but it's it's something that people um study and uh the one interesting thing is you know to look at a you know a planetary system and ask the question like how close to the dynamical stability limit it is right mm. you could imagine you know having a bunch of uh, a bunch of planets and then asking the question if i was to put you know another planet in between two two existing planets, what would that do to the overall stability of the system? Would it, would it just be fine and be kind of, uh, you know, you could just insert another planet or would, would the addition of that single planet just completely destroy the system? Um, and there are some, there are some systems that are very near the dynamical stability limit. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, there, you know, there are ways of, of quantifying this and people do like big suites of simulations to figure out like where that boundary is. Um, but one thing that's kind of interesting is that even the, the really high multiplicity systems from Kepler, so the systems that have like five, six, seven planets, um, in general, those systems are not right up against their stability limit. Um, mm. they're, they're actually kind of, oh, not, not far away from it, but sort of not right up against the edge. And so, you know, what that's telling us is that it's not as if 
systems get formed with with just like a, a huge abundance of planets and there are these massive instability um periods and you know you only see the plant you know the systems after it kind of gets um cleared out enough so that you're no longer at the stability limit there seems to be other processes that are going on that kind of keep systems more comfortably away from the stability mm. limit how how stable is our own planetary system in, in your is the solar system yeah this is, <laughs> this is a really yeah this is a really fascinating question so um there's a there's a really so people have been asking this question for ages um and you know i think it goes back to newton even um so you know newton you know f- well in, you know, Kepler, Kepler figured out that, you know, planets are moving on ellipses and the relationship between their distance and, and orbital period. Um, Newton, uh, you know, developed a deeper understanding of Kepler's relationships, understanding their interactions being due to gravitational forces. Um, but I think, you know, Newton was sort of concerned about the interactions between, between planets. Like, could they possibly be, um, uh, you know, leading to instabilities, right? And this kind of bothered Newton because he had this idea that, you know, the universe was divine, you know, God had a had a big role to play in the, the placement of planets. And so anything that was near sort of uh, concerns of instability were, were a big, was a big problem. Um, and then, you know, a while later, um, people started measuring the, the distance of Jupiter and Saturn to, to the Earth and kind of very carefully measuring their orbits. Um, and this was sort of like around the 1700s. And, you know, you had, you had people um, making these very precise measurements of orbits and realizing, hey, Jupiter and Saturn seem to be getting closer and closer together. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> and this, this also bothered people, right? Because if you run the clock forward and Jupiter and Saturn are getting, you know, very close together, eventually they're going to hit. And that also... Uh, seemed to be a problem because it, it, um, offended their kind of like, uh, you know, religious sensibilities, right? Why would God make, make a system that, you know, where the planets collided? Right. Um, and so it was a big relief to people when, um, uh, folks by the name of, of Laplace and Lagrange discovered that this, the observation that Jupiter and Saturn are moving closer together is really only temporary. And that the kind of on long time scales, they kind of uh, oscillate back and forth. They move closer together, then they move farther apart. And there's this really beautiful clockwork in that um, in that interaction, which we call Laplace-Lagrange oscillations. And so then, you know, people breathe the sigh of relief um, <laughs> because it seemed as if, okay, you know, things move, you know, are moving closer together, but it's periodic and they'll never hit each other. Um so that's that was kind of the story up until the '90s, um, but then you know, with the advent of of more and more sophisticated computers, people could um, could analyze the long term evolution of the solar system for you know billions of years. And what's remarkable is that the solar system is not, in fact, periodic. That periodic dependency of that you know Laplace and Lagrange found that's only sort of one limiting case. But if you look at all of the planets in the solar system, they're chaotic. And so it means, A, um, we can't predict the, uh, the configuration of the solar system far into the future. Because, you know, chaos means um, exponential sensitivity to in, uh, initial conditions. And so even if we knew the present day positions of the planets perfectly, right, any sort of uncertainty about that would cause the um, the predictions to diverge into the future. And so even with all of our sophisticated calculations today, we don't know what the solar system will look like in a billion years. It's just, it's impossible. Mm. Um, and I think so, people are happy with that in a sense. Like, I think people are, nobody wants a story where the earth could just fly off its string at any moment or something like that. But the earth could fly off. Yeah. How much forward velocity would you need to, to pull that off? Additional. Well, so this, yeah. is, this is sort of the the answer to your to your original question, which is how stable is the solar system, right? It's not it's not known. The solar system because you can't you can't actually forward predict the solar system for, um, in a detailed sense throughout the lifetime of the sun, which can't be done. 
what you can do is you can simulate um, different versions of the solar system that are all very, you know, within the margin of error of our current understanding and say, okay, I've got a thousand, you know, credible models of the solar system. Let me see how that advances with time. And when you do that, you find that some in some solar systems, in some future solar systems, Mercury gets, uh, you know, uh, sent into the sun Oof. because there's some dynamical instability that that arises. And in other ones, you know, nothing happens. So, you know, there the uh, the solar system is kind of marginally stable on you know 10 billion year timescales. But um, well, that should work for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah good enough it, it, it works. It works for us, um, but it's something that would have deeply disturbed people like Newton, Laplace, and Lagrange because they all had these sort of aesthetic um, sensibilities, right? They they thought that the universe needed to be perfect, periodic, um, predictable, musical, you know, like the hand, yeah, the handiwork of God, and you know what God would make something chaotic. Mm. So um, anyway, I, I I love I love that sort of historical trajectory because it's you know. It's interesting to 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 think about problems that people like Newton would have appreciated, uh, mm. you know, four hundred years ago. It also yeah. brings up something really interesting. Go ahead. No, no, no. What I was going to say is the the same instability in the distance between Jupiter and Saturn that is apparent on a small enough scale or a time scale becomes no longer a problem on a longer time scale, and the specificity of our observations are kind of undergoing a similar sort of expansion, right? Where we the capabilities that we have for looking with high powered telescopes into the solar system and farther is one lifetime right now like what are we gonna you're asking you're asking like how how well we can predict the the orbits into the future i mean i more just like are there things that we're seeing that are cycles whose whose period is longer than the period of time that we've been observing so we're watching something as it's happening that will later become apparent to be part of a cycle that's starting to drift oh, in a different oh. direction. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I, yeah, I forget exactly how long those Laplace-Lagrange oscillations are. They're on the time scale of several thousand years. So even at the even when you know people were getting worried about the you know uh, apparent collision course of Jupiter and Saturn, right? It was it was a very small effect. Um, but what they found was that, you know, if you kind of, um, forward model that, you know, they eventually turn around and, and everything's fine. Um, so your, your question was, you know, are there things that we're observing today that are, we're just, you know, one part of a cycle and we haven't quite figured out what the cycle is yet. Um, this is, you know, this is now really kind of, uh, moving away from my own expertise, but I think that there's, there are, uh, cosmological theories that um, have a have a cyclic nature to them as well. Um, so, you know, we know that at least from our own perspective, the universe is expanding and it's expanding at an accelerating rate, right? And if you just let that go into the future, um, you know, you'll find that the, the universe basically expands at a faster and faster rate. And it, eventually that starts to look like another big bang, right? Exponential expansion. Um, and so there's there's sort of a, a neat theory. I think this is it's by Roger Penrose um, called conformic cyclic co cosmology, where basically the kind of the end state of accelerating expansion basically looks like another Big Bang, um, and you have these you know this infinite ladder of expansions. So that's that's at least one example of something where a, it could be going on, and we're only seeing a tiny little snapshot of it. But there's some there's some very long time scale thing that we don't know about. Well, I guess there's also the that's idea all, that that's all I know about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but also like it could be. I've heard other cosmologists talk about the idea that maybe the gravity would balance it perfectly at some point, and it will just be like an oscillating universe in some sense as well. Which is yeah, yeah. That I mean, so that has sort of fallen out of favor. Um, this was something that was popular in the eighties back when we didn't know how much matter was in the universe. So people in the, in the eighties, you know, they, they knew about the, 
the the sort of different qualitative outcomes of, of the universe, right? If you have more than a certain amount of mass, um, the Einstein equations predict that the universe stops expanding and then starts contracting. That's a perfectly legitimate outcome of the of the Einstein equations. Um, and so at that point, you know, people were saying, oh, well, if, if it, you know, if it contracts, right, well, then we're eventually going to come to a big crunch, and then there'll be another big bang. And that kind of has this nice sort of like cyclic um, appearance. But these days, uh, you know, the, the sort of the money is very much on, on expansion and acceleration. Mm. So um, these cyclic models, where you have a big crunch are, you know, people don't talk about them too much anymore. Mm. So let's talk about what you're working on right now with your your group and um, what's the what's in the future for you and yeah where what what are you going to be doing in the lab like later today or what what are your projects that you're most excited about? Yeah, um, I think right now um, I'm I'm very interested in how small planets form, and so this this gets back to um, some of the things that that we talked about at the beginning of our, of our conversation, which are, um, you know, like the, this population of planets that Kepler showed us to be so common, right? So, you know, the, the fact that most stars seem to have a planet between the size of earth and Neptune within Mercury's orbit. So this is, you know, this is something that we didn't know 10 years ago. Um, and now, now we know that planets like that are extremely common. So the sort of questions that like get me out of bed in the morning are how do these planets form and why don't we have such a planet in our own solar system? Um, and so what I'm doing and what my group is doing is we're sort of studying these types of planets from, from a variety of angles. Um, so for example, one of the, um, the processes that is, that is thought to produce this, this bifurcation in sizes between super earths and sub Neptunes um, is a phenomenon called mass loss. So I sort of explained this earlier, but it's like, if you have some process that dumps energy into the envelope of planets that can drive a wind and cause the splitting of the sizes. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is observe that mass loss in real time. Um, and we can do that by studying young planets. So most of the planets that we know about are kind of mature planets, planets that are several billion years old. And you know, they're great, except uh, mo much of the interesting processes take place in the first, you know, million or 10 million years of a planet's lifetime. And so when you're looking at a planet that's a billion years old, a lot of those important processes have kind of long since passed, and you're looking at something where it's concluded. So going after young planets and trying to study these processes in real time um, is, is a really sort of uh, exciting, uh, you know, area of, of research and it's something I'm, I'm working on. Um, another thing that I'm very interested in is um, making ever more precise measurements of, of planet masses. And so there's a new instrument that um, I've been working on for the last eight years with a, a team led at, at Caltech called the Keck Planet Finder. Um, and this is going to be, well, this we just commissioned it uh, a week and a half ago, um, but it's, it's the world's most advanced um, radial velocity machine. Um, it's a, you know, it's a spectrometer that's stabilized at the atomic level. And, you know, we're using it to, to, to make very precise measurements of, um, the spectral lines from stars and, and detect planets through the Doppler method. Um, and, you know, just with a better instrument, um, being able to make, you know, more measurements of planet masses or higher precision measurements of planet masses, we're going to learn a lot more about how, how planets form and evolve. Is that when you say atomically stabilized, you mean, is that like a, a built-in inferometer or something, some sort of so, yeah, cesium? This, this spectrometer, it's a, um, well, yeah, there's, there is some, some cool stuff uh, in there. So this spectrometer is a, is a, uh, a piece of equipment that, you know, splits light into its different colors, just like any other spectrometer. But what we're trying to do is measure the Doppler shift from small planets orbiting large stars. And that Doppler effect is very small. So, um, you know, as a point of reference, the Earth, when it goes around the sun, induces a wobble that's 10 centimeters per second. So, you know, that's kind of like this, right? So we have to see, you know, if a star that's light years away from us, you know, is, is sort of like crawling toward us or crawling away from us. 
that's what we need to do to, to find Earths around other stars. Uh. Um, and in order to make that measurement, you need to measure the wavelength of a star at a precision of, of a, you know, a part in a billion. Um, and so you're talking about very small shifts of spectral lines. And just on a detector, when you sort of, you know, think about the, how big that line is on a detector is, a, you know, is about half a dozen silicon atoms wide. So, you know, we use, you know, we use cameras, we use uh, uh, CCD detectors to, to measure the position of lines. And uh, the shifts that we're trying to detect are only a few atoms in, in size. And so that requires building a very, very sensitive and stabilized spectrometer. And so a lot of really impressive uh, engineering went into this, into this machine. Um, you know, I can kind of uh, give you some of the highlights. Um, like, for example, the, the Keck Planet Finder is made out of an exotic glass ceramic hybrid called Zero Dur, which is a material that has zero coefficient of thermal expansion. So, you know, as the, the instrument heats up and cools down, it doesn't change its size at all. So that helps, um, the, you know, the, the whole instrument is in a vacuum chamber, which, um, removes variability due to pressure, um, which, which would also change where the lines land. Um, and, you know, even, even with all of that, the, the lines still move around a little bit on the detector. And so we need to calibrate them with, with extreme precision. And one of the things that we use to do that is something called a laser frequency comb, which is a device that produces a, um, you know, a, a set of lines at a tunable frequency that have 15 digits of accuracy behind them. So it's a very, very precise ruler. And then we measure the, the shifts of the spectral lines relative to that. So, um, there's a lot of cool technology that's in this that's in this instrument, and you know it's all in the surface uh, service of trying to detect stars that are doing this um, and finding Earths around other stars. Is that a is is that a terrestrial instrument? That's exactly yeah. what I was going to ask. You. Yeah. Wild. So this yeah this instrument is on is on uh, the Keck telescope, um, and we we just achieved first light on November 9th. Um, so it's, it's very recent, very exciting. Um, we're still working out some of the kinks, you know, you don't, you don't get atomic level stability right off, right out of the box. Uh, you have to do a lot more, um, tests and stuff, but we're well on our way. And, you know, you may have heard, if you've talked to other astronomers, you may have, you know, heard about sort of the, the effects of the earth's atmosphere and how the earth's atmosphere, you know, blurs the light, the, the light from stars. Um, and so what's, what's remarkable is that, you know, going to space is is a huge advantage if you're trying to make very sharp images. Like if you're trying to, you know, get the highest res resolution possible, you should go to space um, and uh, just put your telescope there because you're not going to have the effects of the atmosphere. But what's remarkable is that if you're trying to measure very small changes in wavelength, you can actually do a really good job from the ground hmm. because the star is, you know, it's its colors are kind of, you know, changing as it goes through different paths in the atmosphere. The, um, the shape of the star on your detector is changing, but the sort of spectral information uh, is very stable. Hmm. And so it's kind of remarkable that, you know, we can peer up through this, through this atmosphere, which is, you know, screwing up all sorts of other measurements and still make uh, measurements of velocity shift that are good to a part in a billion. And I've always been absolutely astonished by the coincidence that our atmosphere is perfectly transparent in the optical region. It's just like, if you look at the absorption of our atmosphere, it's pretty opaque to most wavelengths. And it's like, there's just like a couple of nice little notches. Also one in the upper radio, which is obviously really useful for mm -hmm. astronomy too. I just think that's such an incredible coincidence in a way. Well, is it, is it a coincidence or, or, you know, is there some sort of, uh, you know, evolutionary pressure for us to, yeah. uh, you know, develop eyesight in the, the transparent. Yeah, the exactly. Exactly. Oh, it's so interesting. I have one line of questioning that we didn't really get to. Do you have time still? Sure. How much of an effect does electromagnetism have when you're looking at planets and stars and all of these like formation 
like in terms of formation and in terms of orbits, because it seems to me like space is a pretty charged environment and you have these planets that are also, they have their own magnetic fields and they're traveling through it. And it seems like they would be interacting, but everybody that we've spoken to seems to discount the, the, the size of the effect. Yeah. I mean, what I would say is that, um, so, you know, most objects are, are electrostatically neutral. So it's not as if, you know, you have a planet that's like positively charged and another planet that's negatively charged and they're like going to be tugging on one another. And that tug is going to be anywhere close to the effect of gravity, right? Gravity, uh, gravity is the dominant long range force in planetary architectures. However, right. Um, you know, electromagnetism does play an important role in, in the formation of planets. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of examples I could give you. Um, but one, just one that's close to my, my line of, of work is the ability of planets to resist having their, their envelopes blown away. So remember, um, you know, we were talking about how some, some models that explain the radius gap, right. Do so with, um, you know, the, the outflow, right. The heating and then outflow of, of envelopes. Now, when it does that, right. The, the, the gas that's getting blown off, um, is likely ionized, um, just given the type of the, the type of heat source that that's coming in. So if you have an ionized gas, that's going to interact very strongly with a magnetic field. You have charged particles and charged particles like to follow magnetic field lines. So if a planet has a strong magnetic field, that magnetic field will um, influence the rate at which the the mass gets blown off. Now, I I don't I'm not familiar enough with the exact models to tell you if it helps or hurts. I could see it going both ways actually, but it certainly affects. Um, and for example, right, the Earth's magnetic field plays an important role in uh, keeping our atmosphere right. So we have you know we have a, a magnetic field which is generated by our um, you know, still molten core. And that magnetic field plays a big role in protecting the Earth's atmosphere from solar, um, you know, coronal emissions. So when the sun, you know, belches out a whole bunch of charged particles, right? It's, if we had no magnetic field, those particles would come in and they would heat the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere and probably drive some of it off to space. So the fact that we have a magnetic field deflects that um, that solar wind and in some ways helps protect our atmosphere. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's just one way in which, uh, magnetism is important for planet, uh, planet evolution. But, but in it, terms of the large scale orbits, um, it's, it's all gravity. In terms of planetary formation, how early do you think that electromagnetism starts to play a role? Because when, when people talk about condensation in the protoplanetary disk, what it normally sounds like is just dust particles that are coming together that gradually become larger and larger. And it seems like a very physical interaction and electromagnetism isn't really talked about do you think that it starts that early no no no. it's i mean it's important right so the i mean the one of the the big sort of um pieces of the planet formation process is how you go from tiny little you know dust grains up to full full formed planets right i mean if you think about it right you're you're starting with you know something that's as small as like smoke you know smoke particles and somehow you have to take that and build it all the way up to the planet that's the size of the Earth. So you have to grow something over just, you know, many orders of magnitude in terms of size. Um, and, you know, one one of the stages of this growth, people think, is is basically driven by electromagnetism. So you've got, you've got um, you know, soot, you know, uh, dusty grains, and they have a fractal kind of geometry just based on how they, they form. And there are electrostatic forces that cause those those dust grains to kind of stick together. So you know, sometimes people describe it as like like dust bunnies, right? Like mm -hmm. dust bunnies in your in your house. Like they all have a little bit of electrostatic potential. They kind of um, collect, and something like that is going on in the early stages of of planetary formation. So on very short scales, right? We're not talking about like 
you know, Jupiter and the Earth having significant, you know, electrostatic influence on one another. But like at the very microscopic level, that's an example of electromagnetism playing a role. And and I think that I recall in terms of explaining the angular momentum problem that there was the I, I believe I don't know how th- thoroughly it's entertained at this point, but I believe Alphen supplied some sort of magnetic braking mechanism for how that angular momentum was transferred to the dust cloud and so forth. Um, but I, I can't recall yeah, the particulars I, I, of it. I, I don't know enough to, to comment on that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask how you knew we had dust bunnies in our house. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of justifying keeping them so we could do experiments. <laughs> well, um, yeah, this has been fascinating. I, I really appreciate you giving the time to us and uh, helping us inch forward a little bit closer in our understanding of planetary evolution. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how this, especially the discussion of the near, the near solar planets, what, what do you call them, the interior planets, the small, uh, oh, dense the ones, in, the yeah, close the ends. Close in yeah, ones. it's really interesting because... I don't know, yeah, there's a... So yeah, yeah, super Earth, sub-Neptunes, uh, I just call them close in, close in small planets. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, the key questions, like why, why are they so common and why don't we have them in our own solar system? Mm. Like that's, that's what I really want to know. Mm. <laughs> or did we used to? <laughs> Ooh, maybe. <laughs> All right, Dr. Pettigrew, it's, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for your great questions. And I hope you guys get a, hope you guys put some shows on the, on the board too, that we can check out the rock fans. We're we're dying to, we're dying to, it's been too long. Awesome. All right, man. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.